السلام عليكم بيس بي ابون يو بسم الله الحمد لله الصلاة والسلام على رسول الله When I mention God, what comes to your mind? Do we not owe to ourselves and to God to get to know Him? Those of us who worship Him, do we know whom we are worshiping? Without really knowing God, His worship can be superficial, routine, or out of obligation. Aside from the fact He is the Creator, when we say God, who is God? How do we get to know Him if we know nothing or not much about Him? How would you define God? And what are the ways to get to know God? In part one of this series, we discuss the essence of God from scholars' point of view and the Quranic perspective and about His knowledge of everything, His position as the Creator and sustainer and the order or design within the universe. We now continue our discussion on getting to know God methodologies. We start by answering the questions on how God sees and hears everything in somewhat detail. God's seeing and hearing comes from the fact He is all-encompassing and all aware. Hence, his knowledge encompasses everything. A crude example is that if I talk about the red apple to you right now, while you do not see an apple in my hand, you will know exactly what I'm talking about as a picture of a red apple comes to your mind because you saw and learned about apples in your early life. The difference is, your knowledge of red apple is based on what you saw and learned at some time, at some point in time. Where before that point, you did not know about apples. But God's knowledge is eternal and all-encompassing. It was always there even before the creation of things because knowledge is in His essence. Thought. To us, seeing means the reflection of light as it bounces off the object and then reflected in the eye's lens and converted to signals carried to our brain. Hearing, same way, means our ears convert vibration in the air at different frequencies, then converted into nerve signals that travel to the brain. The exalted and glorified God, who does not have eyes or ears or brain as instruments of sensing and processing, how does He hear or see or understand? What is the meaning of Sami'un Alim, Sami'un Basir, all hearing, all knowing, or all seeing in Islam? If Islam wants to define God as in Judaism or Christianity, as we spoke last time, then he becomes a statue, a statue. Islam came to correct such notion. But at the same time, we must explain what the text means when it says he's all hearing, all seeing. The Quran explains it. Firstly, as humans, when you see or hear, your distance with the objects determines how loud you hear it, and how clear you or, or vivid you see it. Note that the Qur'an says in Surah Ra'd, سَبَاءٌ مِنْكُمْ مَنْ أَسَرَّ الْغَوْلَ وَمَنْ جَهَرَ بِهِ وَمَنْ هُوَ مُسْتَخْفٍ بِاللَّيْلِ وَسَارَبٌ بِالنَّهَارِ It is all the same to him, whether you speak in secret or out loud, and try to hide in the darkness, of night or walk in the brightness of day. It is the same, equal to Him, whether you whisper or say it as loud as you can. You can hide, the deep, you can hide, in, the, hide in a deep darkness of the night or walk in public at high noon. It is all the same to Him. He hears and sees equally in both cases. Note, God did not say, I hear both. 
to mean one high, one low, like us. He says it is equal to him, whether you speak in secret, softly, or out loud. This is why Muslim scholars have referred this to God's knowledge. They say God's hearing is his knowledge of what can be heard. God's sight belongs to his knowledge, or his knowledge of what can be seen. And of course, unseen too, but that's beyond our perception. And due to the fact God is all-knowing, God has infinite knowledge, then his seeing, hearing, all stem from his infinite knowledge. It's just that his knowledge of things and objects have different interpretation for us. Some among Salafis think God hears like we do or sees like we do. And when you ask them how, we don't know how, they say. While Allah explains it in the Quran, as he says, the reason I see and hear everything is because I am present and witness, shahuda, to everything. This is a very important response by the Qur'an. As it says, وَمَا تَكُونُوا فِي شَعْنٍ وَمَا تَتْلُوا مِنْهُ مِنْ قُرْآنٍ وَلَا تَعْمَلُونَ مِنْ عَمَلٍ إِلَّا كُنَّا عَلَيْكُمْ شُهُودًا إِذْ تُفِيدُونَ فِيهِ And you're not engaged in any matter or recite any portion of the Qur'an and you do not do any deed except that we are witness over you when you are involved in it. Therefore, God's presence and being witness to that which we do stems from his ilm, knowledge, his witness to our actions, our voices, and our intentions. He is with you, wherever you are, and sees all that you do. When we think of God this way, the questions raised are answered. By the way, when we talk about God's knowledge, we do not think of our own knowledge, which is advantageous, and how we gained it. Plus, once we did not have it, but we have it now. God's knowledge is absolute, infinite, and eternal, outside of time domain, as we covered last time. Some people do think God actually hears and sees, much like we do. When you say to them, God does not have ears and eyes, which are instruments by which we hear and see, they say, well, he hears and sees differently. You ask how? They say, we don't know. Such a question is not resolved this way. We know other entities like animals see and hear differently as well. Thus, God's seeing and hearing is not through senses like ours. We hear through movement of air coming to our ears and captured at different frequencies, waves, and translated to electrical signal to be understood by our brain. Same thing about our sight, which is realized as, as light's reflection on the objects are captured by the lens in our eyes, then converted to signals to be processed in our brains, all of which are physical phenomena, physical objects and actions. We ask, do you mean these frequency waves or reflection of light reach God? Do these waves and lights affect God, Naudan Billah, and increase or decrease with distance and time like us? When he hears us, does it change his state? That would mean there is a huduth, occurrence taking place in his essence. And anything new non-eternal, hadith, requires a cause. And it is through cause and effect which we prove existence of God, with God being the original cause, who is eternal. Nothing can be hadith, 
non-eternal in God's essence, thought. Now, by us talking and his hearing, if he hears like us, we caused a hadith, a new state, that now then Allah did not exist in him. And now it does because we spoke. Therefore, day and night people talk and he hears them. And now then Allah, his state changes continuously due to a cause. You see where this conversation goes. All the while, we know Allah is all-encompassing, all-aware. And no creation can cause any change in his thought, essence, and state. Therefore, Allah's hearing is his knowledge of both seen and unseen. He knew what I will be saying today in this lecture, even before creation of the universe, or shall we say from the beginning. And now that I'm giving this lecture, his knowledge takes reality in our world because his knowledge is azali, eternal, pre-existent, and all-encompassing. Hence, time does not enter into his essence, thought, because time is part of his creation. So, unlike our seeing or hearing, which happen through means and instruments and external causes, his hearing and seeing is his knowledge. Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib said, God hears, but not by the sounds coming from throats. His hearing is in his essence, because laysa kamithihi shay. There is nothing like him. He's the first and the last and the outward and the inward and he has full knowledge of all things. Is there a paradox here in this verse? Of course not. First in this verse means before anything appeared or was created. He existed before that. His last meaning he will exist after all creation has disappeared. His outward means Everything in our universe that can be seen are signs of him or manifestation of his work is everywhere. He is bought in, inward or unseen, meaning his thought, essence, cannot be seen because it is beyond our perception. Whichever way you turn, there is the countenance, presence of Allah. He is indeed all-encompassing, the all-knowing. What does Allah, countenance or face of Allah mean in this verse? Does God have a face? The Allah is referring to his essence, thought, and that he is present everywhere. He is all-encompassing. It is through his thought and presence that he is all-knowing and all-aware of all things. Unquestionably, he encompasses everything. God is everywhere. Does not mean if I move my hand, I will touch him. He is muhit, all-encompassing. And I am muhat, one that is encompassed. Muhat cannot influence or change the muhit, the one who encompasses. I can change things or affect things that are in my rank or below my rank, but not the one who is above me. And he is the supreme above his servants, worshippers, and he is the wise, the aware. There are those who insist on literal meaning or literal interpretation when it comes to verses describing God and His actions as they relate to us. Literal interpretation has its place, but not in such verses. What do I mean by that? For example, what does raib mean? It means 
doubt in Arabic. Now, what does it really mean then becomes an analytic interpretation or true meaning where we say there is shak, which is a form of doubt with 50-50 chance, and then there is then, which is between 50 and 99 percent form of doubt, or guess you could call it, until it becomes yaqeen, certainty, which is 100 percent. All of these should be defined so we don't equate then with shak in the text. We analyze the verses, not just do a literal interpretation or translation and move on. As a result, these teachings of the Qur'an must be fully understood so that when someone like Dr. Srush comes out and says the human-like God that sometimes the Qur'an describes, well, is like human. So Muhammad, being a human, must have made up such descriptions through his dreams, as he calls them, prophetic dreams. Such notion stems from not having deep understanding of such verses. Among many of the simple answers to his claim is that a dream cannot be defined. But the Qur'an defines things, limits things. In Surah At-Tur, the verses فَلْيَأْتُوا بَحَدِيثٍ مِثْلِهِ إِنْ كَانُوا صَادِقِينَ then let them produce a statement like it if they are truthful. Firstly, one cannot control the dreams. I cannot tell you to go and dream about some specific topic, then based on that, uh, on the content of the dream, give us a speech. Or an analogy to the verse, I tell you I dreamed about such and such, you go and produce a dream just like it and bring it to me. You will tell me your dream is not in your control. All such notions stem from not knowing God in a true sense. Because if one really knows God, he will know what attributes such as all hearing, all knowing, all seeing really mean. He will understand such attributes in the Quranic context of Laisa Kamethlehi Shai. There is nothing like him. And there is none equal to him. No vision can see him, though he sees all visions. He is the subtle, the aware. And many verses like these provide the definition of who God is. Even our supplication, where we make dua, and sometimes it is answered, sometimes not. And of course, God's will, God's experience, maslaha, and divine decree, ghadar, have a role in our dua. But what happens when we make dua? Imagine I ask you to give me something, and you first say no, but I insist and appeal to your generosity. You then change your mind and give it to me. Does God also change his mind when we appeal to him? Millions of people make dua to God every day. Does God change his mind million times a day? When we supplicate to God, do our dua affect God or change his state? Without Getting too deep into the subject matter as we covered du'a itself in a separate lecture, God's knowledge is part of his thought, essence, and it is not dependent on time like we are. Nothing about God is new, created, or non-eternal, hadith. He is eternity, pre-existence, where nothing is created or new within. Anything that is non-eternal, hadith, or created becomes part of the creation, not part of the creator. So then, what changes when we supplicate, make dua? Few things, again briefly. Firstly, it is us who experience the change. It is I who was not worthy of receiving his face, 
grace, bounty, blessing. But now by turning my attention to him and appealing to him through correct dua with sincerity, I elevate myself to the position where I will receive such blessing and favor from him. Or you can say from here, this state, I elevate myself to a higher stream of grace that is emotion, so I will then have access to it. This grace has always existed in his Mashiya, will, but I had no access to it. My spiritual being has been lifted to a level where I can now receive it. God did not change his mind. A simple physical example is that sun is shining, let's say, at high noon, everywhere, indiscriminately giving out light and warmth to whoever is on its path. However, if one is sitting in the shade, will not receive the light and the warmth unless he steps out of the shade in order to receive it. Otherwise, the sun did not change how it shines. It's been shining before and will be there, shining there, after he moves into its path. His supplication, dua, is really for us and our benefit to change us, not God. Even when you make dua for others, it creates goodwill and benevolence in you for others. It elevates you for your generosity and goodwill, hence you get closer to God and worthy of His grace. However, dua is also an act of worship because just like prayers and fasting, it benefits us by turning our attention to our Creator and the ultimate source for help. This could be one reason as to why not every dua is accepted because a dua must be sincere and change the person who is making it. Furthermore, how can one make a sincere and correct supplication if one does not really know God, hence does not really know who he is appealing to? Secondly, Ibn al-Qayyum says that dua is also a means to gain that which is already decreed for us. The same way we acquire the risk, sustenance, that is written for us by working toward it. If I sit home, not lift a finger, and say my risk is already ordained by God, I will not receive it. Nothing will happen. My job and paycheck are means to receive that sustenance. That is the condition. Dua is similar. We make dua as another mean toward getting that which is ordained for us. Thirdly, yes, duas affect the future, as the Quran says, and when my servants ask you, O Muhammad, concerning me, indeed, I am near. I respond to the invocation of every supplicant when he calls upon me. Respond means to deny or accept, to give something better. But they don't change the decree, Qadar. If the pen has already written down everything that is to happen, it can't change. It is similar to how we have free will, even though Allah knows everything that happens. Let's explain this through an example. Allah writes the qadar or decrees that you make a dua for a job promotion, for example. But you still make the dua from your own will. Allah just knows what you will choose to do, in this case make the dua. But he doesn't necessarily control it or make the decision for you to make the dua. Allah in response to the dua that he knows you will make, he will write in Qadar decrees that you get a promotion. So the dua did affect your future, but it didn't change the Qadar destiny. You chose to make a dua and the pen had already written that into the Qadar. 
And Allah had already written the response to the dua as well. Allah is all-knowing, i.e. He knows the past, the present, and the future to every fine detail. Dua doesn't change destiny. But you do not know what is in store for you in your destiny. If you make dua, you will get the provision that has already been ordained for you. The fact that you will make dua is also known to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but you do not have access to knowledge of Allah. Hence, we are encouraged to make dua, to ask Allah for the things we want, and also dua is a form of uh, worship as discussed earlier. I hope this makes it clear. Imam Ghazali discusses another aspect of dua, supplication, and says, know that destiny includes preventing tribulation through supplication. Therefore, supplication is a cause of preventing tribulation and attracting mercy, just as a shield prevents arrows from striking or water is a cause for plants to come forth from the ground. So, just as a shield, he says, just as a shield prevents the arrow and the two of them meet and struggle with one another, likewise, supplication and tribulation struggle with one another. And there's no contradiction between belief in destiny and carrying weapons in battle. It is in this context the Messenger of God, peace be upon him, said, Destiny is not repelled except by supplication, and nothing increases one's lifespan except piety. Destiny here means the ordained thing, and the meaning of this hadith is that if by destiny one means those things that one fears and expects them to befall, if this person supplicates, next to all, God prevents them from befalling. In this case, the word destiny is used figuratively. This is also made clear from the hadith of the Messenger of God وسلم, concerning healing by the Qur'an, when he said it is from the destiny of God. God has also commanded us to use medicine and make supplication, dua, even though that which has been destined will befall except that it is hidden from man. Since you do not know what is in store for you, you are encouraged to ask or supplicate. You have a chance to ask or not to ask. Whatever the decision, it's already known to Allah Azza wa Jal. His knowledge, however, doesn't prevent your free will. Hence, by supplication, you fulfill what's already written. Your supplication and your choice to make that supplication is already included in the divine destiny, qadr, and knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So far, we have been talking about getting to know God, not worshipping God. Knowing God is different than worshipping God. There may be a scholar or a scientist or any knowledgeable person who believes in God's existence and has a good knowledge of Him, yet in practice does not follow His commands and instructions or submit to Him and worship Him. We Muslims, submitters, not only must know God and submit to Him, but also worship Him. Some people have grown cold toward religion and say, we just believe in God, but forget about religion because it has become a source of disputes and fights. To them, we must say, the God that you believe in is a God without trace, impact, or benefit. He is an abstract concept who created us and this universe, and then left us alone without a plan and instructions. It is like you go and invest 
a lot of capital, buy a land, build a large facility, buy a lot of production equipment, hire a lot of people, and then invite everyone to a grand opening of the company. And then someone asks, what is the purpose of this company? What are we supposed to do? What is our duty? Is there a plan? What's the product? Only to find out there is no plan, no strategy, no product, no schedule, and so forth. Employees can come and go or not even show up as they please and do whatever they wish. Who in the right mind would do such a thing? No wise person would start such a project. A wise person will have a product in mind, an output, a plan or a strategy on how to design, build and market such product, and what are the company policies, and the outline of what each worker is supposed to do before raising the capital and building the company. Now, are you saying the God who is the creator of this vast company and factory called the universe creates us from nothing, places us on earth, but he has no plan, no instructions, and no expectations? Hence, people can roam the earth and do whatever they want. A God with no message telling us what his purpose of our creation was our duty to him, as well as rest of creation, where we came from and where we're going, no plan and message whatsoever, a God without opinion who is okay with whatever we do. To that end, we ask, what's the difference in practice between you and the one who does not believe in God? The Quran has an amazing statement regarding such people. وَمَا قَدَرَ اللَّهُ وَمَا قَدَرَ اللَّهُ حَقَّ قَدْرِهِ إِذْ قَالُوا مَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهُ عَلَى بَشَرٍ مِنْ شَيْءٍ And they did not appraise Allah with true appraisal when they said Allah did not reveal to a human being anything. The verse is saying these people who don't believe in prophethood they have not considered Allah as He deserves to be considered. They have not gotten to know Allah as they truly should have. Therefore, the important conclusion here is that your getting to know God is not complete until you learn about worshiping Him and living in accordance to His pleasure, His instructions and acceptance. If you get to know God this way, immediately the role of prophethood becomes clear to you. You're going to want to know about God, His signs, about His instructions on how to live a happy, righteous, peaceful life, His instruction on how to worship Him, etc. All of which can be found in His book, His Revelation, brought to us by his prophet. Of course, at the end of the day, we still have our free will and we can take his book and instructions or not. We can listen to his message or not. In fact, we have to choose to do so based on our free will, as there is no compulsion in religion. As such, the oneness of God, Tawheed, is the foundation of all beliefs in Islam and is given as the concept around which everything revolves in the Qur'an. The Day of Judgment or Return to God hinges on Tawheed, oneness of God as well. Without God's plan and purpose, the return to Him for the Day of Reckoning is meaningless. If he has no expectation and purpose for us, then accountability and the ultimate justice in Resurrection Day is meaningless. Allah says in the Qur'an, 
و ما خلقنا السماء والارض و ما بينهما باطلا ذلك ذن الذين كفروا and when and we did not create the heavens and the earth and what's in between them in vain that is the guesswork or assumption of those who disbelieve worshiping god means praising and glorifying god according to his prescription on how to do so through his prophets and then tuning our lives and actions according to his commands and instructions keep in mind if we serve anyone else other than god they will want to use us or make use of us even take advantage of us however god is free of all needs worshiping him or not worshiping him does not add to him or take away anything from him it is rather for us to elevate us to free us from being slave to others check out the verse we recited from surah fatir earlier ya ayyuhan nasu antumul fuqara ila allah wallahu huwal ghaniyul hamid O mankind, it is you who are in need of Allah, while Allah is free of need, the praiseworthy. Indeed, Allah is free of all needs, but why does it say Hamid, praiseworthy, right after Al-Ghani, free of need? The attribute Al-Hamid is mentioned multiple times in the Quran, and with exception of few places, they both come together, Al-Ghani Al-Hamid. free of need and praiseworthy why when we look at the word alhamid we have hamd which means praise or glorify which is an intellectual definition then we have hamid which is isma fa'il or active participle or noun of the doer in this case the doer who does the praising the praiser if you will then we have uh, mahmud which is isma maf'ul refers to the passive participle or noun of the object it denotes the recipient of an action in this case one who is praised as allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to his messenger in the quran asa an yab'athaka rabbuka maghaman mahmuda it may be that your lord will raise you to a praised state in which mahmud means praised then we have alhamid praiseworthy which is different than mahmud mahmud means the praised that is when one praises another that person is praised so there has to be one who does the praising but alhamid means even if there is none to praise him he is praiseworthy by his essence thought because he is perfect and has all perfect attributes even if there was no creation to praise him he is praiseworthy glorified or exalted by his essence zat any person we serve is going to use us make us work for him or her or even take advantage of us for their benefit but if we serve allah azza wa jalla he does not need our servitude and will not use us or take advantage of us because he is free of need the praiseworthy being his slave frees us from being a slave to anyone or anything else we as creation are in need of him not the other way around that is why the quran says ya ayyuhan nasu antumul fuqara ila allah Allahu wal ghaniyul hamid O mankind it is you who are in need of Allah while Allah is the free of needs and praiseworthy he is glorified and exalted without anyone's praise and glorification that is what al hamid mean serving Allah azza wa jalla is a catalyst for our elevation our progress and success what better honor and privilege to have than having allah as our lord to serve him and worship him some people believe in god meaning they don't reject him 
and even mention his name, but it seems they are too lazy or too proud to prostrate before God. They think it is a humiliation to bow down and prostrate. But then they bow down in submission to their bosses and at work and praise others. Everything we have belongs to him, to Allah. We're nothing but a very small member of his creation. It was Shaitan, Satan, who said, I am better than mankind because of so and so. One must not forget God is the living, the eternal, meaning everyone and everything is in state of change and eventually expires with time. The Quran expresses this concept in many ways, like Kullu man alayha fan, everyone upon it, upon earth, will perish. And there will remain his presence, essence, of your Lord, owner of majesty and honor. And that La ilaha illa wa kulli shay'in haliku illa wajra. There is no God except He. All things perish except His presence, essence, Zat. That is why when Ibrahim السلام, saw the sun and the moon set or came down, he said, these can't be my Lord. I do not like things that set. I am looking for the one in, in whose essence there is no change or expiration. What did the monotheist man who came from the other side of town in Surat Yasin say? Why should I not worship him, serve him, who has originated me, and to whom you, sh you shall all be returned? Everything I have belongs to him. He is the one who created me, originated me. If I do not submit to him, if I do not serve him, I have lied to the world of creation and existence. Why should I not worship him and serve him? It is our privilege and honor to serve and worship our Lord who is the merciful, the kind, the gracious, and is free of needs. And whatever he says is to our benefit and advantage. All true servants of his, including the prophets and messengers, were proud and honored to serve him, to dedicate their lives to him. Then you have people who believe in his existence, yet are too lazy to pray, two raka units, to him. Some of them think they are belittling or humiliating themselves if they do that. Yet they are willing to do that before a human just like them in order to get ahead in their job or position, not realizing whatever they have, their life, their wealth, their sustenance, their health, all belong to Allah Azzawajal. They don't realize we have nothing of our own without Him. That is the state of a man who is misled. Our Salaf said, do not be a slave to anyone or anything as God created you free. Freedom starts with true submission and servitude toward God. Speaking of worshiping God, another way of knowing and worshiping God is when one actually feels his presence through one's heart. Often you might pray and even focus your thoughts in prayer, but not with presence of the heart, then you don't feel it. But there are times that you do have such reverence, khushu, that you just burst into tears, not because you are asking him for something, but because you feel his presence and your connection to him while realizing and appreciating all the things he has given you, thus having such a joyful moment. It's as if you are seeing him. 
you are in a state of such certainty, yaqeen. This is really knowing God through his own grace, allowing you to reach such a point of reverence. Otherwise, you can't force yourself to reach such a state. But when it comes, it comes like you have not experienced anything like it. That is when not only your mind is focused, but also your heart is present in your prayer. It is by real getting to know God through what we discussed, including his attributes, that one can truly understand whom they are talking to in their prayers, thereby increasing the chances of having such sincerity, humility, reverence, and joy in their prayers. And in fact, with all acts of worship, this can even be extended to appreciation of anything you see around you at any moment as you see God's signs and God's work once you really get to know God. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.